Hi, this is Beth Fox, and this is a presentation, How Not to Be a UX Checkbox. I originally presented this at Canucks 2017 in Ottawa, uh, and I've re-recorded this with audio um, so that I could share it with you. So, um, as I said, my name is Beth Fox. I've been with the province of Nova Scotia now for about four years working in digital service uh, as a UX expert and a UX uh, researcher. Um, and I uh, want to take you back in time and tell you a couple of stories um, about the UX checkbox. So um, probably about six months into my career uh, in the province, I finally got this you know, request to come and be part of a project. Uh, I was the only person with you user experience even in my job description uh, at the time in the province. And uh, so I was really excited. I thought, okay, I've made it. I'm finally on a project. I'm going to get to do all the things. I was super excited. I went to the very first meeting, uh, you know, listened to the project team talk about the work that they were doing. And I got really excited. I thought, okay, we can go out. We can talk to our users. Maybe we can build prototypes. And then after that, we'll test them. And it was just this big wall of sort of nope. Um, which, as a user experience person, uh, didn't feel very good. It was sort of like this. Um, and actually, the, you know, Keanu wasn't the only one that day. Uh, I was there too. This is me <laughs> having the sudden uh, and abrupt realization that I was actually just a checkbox in my organization, um, or it certainly felt that way. Uh, and I sort of had this moment of truth where I was like, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, this isn't why I came to government. This isn't uh, the type of work I want to do. I really, really wanted to make a difference for users. Um, and inside a checkbox, that was going to be really difficult to do. So over the past three and a half, four years of my uh, current job, I've come up with a few sort of effective strategies for getting out of, of the checkbox. And I wanted to share those today. The first strategy is really about talking to people, right? Uh, a lot of people don't know anything about usability or user experience. They've never really thought about it. Uh, and you're there because you're the subject matter expert. Uh, and so when you get invited to these meetings or you get invited into projects, that's what you feel like you should do, right? Tell people what they don't know. Um, I want to share a story uh, about the first usability test we ever ran uh, internally. Uh, it took us a while to get a test lab up and running, and we were finally able to, on a project, um, somebody in my organization had said, oh, whoa, they were about to launch something. Uh, maybe we better test that. So we ran the test. Uh, we recruited some really great participants. Uh, they validated a lot of the things that I, as a UX person, was concerned about within the interface and the application and all the things. And we had, we had really what I would have considered a really successful test um, that highlighted some real key issues for the project team. And uh, so I prepared a report. Uh, I pulled all the video clips of all of the users backing away from scary parts of the interface and talking about how overwhelmed they were uh, at all the right moments and even showing the things that were working well. Uh, and I brought together the project team and I presented our findings and I shared with them um, these clips and all of these uh, all this feedback from users and all this actual real-world uh, usability uh, concerns. And it was sort of a TSN turning point in my career. I'll never forget the moment uh, at the end when the PM, who had been listening intently, uh, got up, uh, said, thank you, Beth, that was really interesting, and he left. And I was thinking, what? What? They're not going to change anything? They're going to launch this as it is? And I was just completely flabbergasted. Um, and this is a little bit of uh, something I like to refer to as the moon door maneuver, um, which if you're not a Game of Thrones fan, um, is a castle that has what's called the moon door, which is this nice handy little trap door that uh, you can gently nudge someone out of if they uh, become problematic to your strategy. Uh, and so <laughs> in the real world, um, the moon door might be something like, no longer being invited to project meetings or possibly um, presenting findings and having nothing change. Um, and I think any of us uh, who work in large organizations may recognize or have experienced the moon door uh, once or twice in our career. Uh, and so I've had a little bit of time to reflect and think, well, what happened there? Why, why would that go like that? Uh, and the first thing is, is to talk about empathy. 
And there's a lot of discussion in the service design community about empathy for end users. Um, but what we don't talk about enough is empathy for the project team and all the constraints and all the struggles and all the difficult decisions they've had to make along the way. Um, some people have been on a journey for in government maybe two or three years trying to get something out the door. Um, and then you show up and tell them it's all wrong. Uh, isn't very empathetic. The next part is that probably in that space, there's a few other subject matter experts that uh, bring their own expertise to bear. And the reality is some of them feel like checkboxes as well. Um, privacy experts, uh, security experts, all of those folks, uh, they're probably feeling a little on the fringe and uh, nobody wants to feel that way. The other thing I'll say is I have experienced in my career a couple of times where I've seen people try to go toe to toe with privacy or security. And I'm just here to tell you straight up, as a user experience subject matter expert, if you try to go to battle um, and get into some kind of fight with those types of experts, you're gonna lose every time. Privacy, security, those are things people will take seriously. Poor user experience, not so much. And so I'd really encourage you not necessarily to um, consider yourself at war with these folks, but rather that they're allies and you wanna really build those relationships and, and work on collaborating with those people because ultimately a slightly less than perfect user experience that's private and secure um, is better than a really terrible one that's like uber secure. And so those alliances are really, really important. I think kind of the final point about this is it kind of doesn't matter if you're right or not. Um, you can be right, but if your timing is poor, uh, if it's three weeks prior to launch and you come in and tell somebody just how ugly their baby is, you're probably not going to get the response you want. You're definitely going out the door at that point. Um, and so if you've been invited in to review the user experience of a particular project, late in the game, um, telling them all of the terrible things probably is of less value than finding the things that are actually able to be changed in under the constraints that are there. Um, sometimes it's things like fixing um, poor error messaging and make sure, making sure it's clear or identifying one key failure point and maybe mitigating that with copy or with whatever you can do, uh, but working within those constraints rather than telling them they shouldn't. Or, or can't go forward like that. Um, telling everyone what you know, because <laughs> uh, you're the expert, is probably best uh, saved for opportunities when you're speaking at conferences or other things, um, and not necessarily for the 11th hour right before a team uh, is about to launch a product that they've been uh, putting their blood, sweat, and tears into uh, for ages. Sort of the second method, and this I think is the real powerhouse one, and our friends at GDS talk all the time about show, don't tell. Uh, and so I've really taken this to heart and I've seen it really be quite effective. Um, it's, it's about the fact that you have a user perspective or you're able to have a user perspective that other people who are deep inside a program can't necessarily see. Uh, and your perspective is valuable uh, and it's something that only you have um, but telling people isn't as effective as showing them. So I want to share a little story about uh, a recent request I got in the spring um, from our privacy folks who I have built alliances with. Uh, and they were uh, rolling out some mandatory training for government employees. Uh, and they had asked me for my opinion um, as they were getting ready to launch. But then in the email, I noticed that, oh, of course, they're pretty well done. Um, and this email, like many others, felt a lot like, hey, could you just please check our box? Um, and so I sat on that email for a couple of days and I thought, oh man, what am I going to do? Like, I don't want to check the box um, for them. And I, I really don't know much about this project other than they're asking for my help. So I want to come to the table with something. The realization I had is that in this case, I actually am the user. I've spent a lot of time telling people I'm not the user, but in this case, um, I am a government employee and I am expected to take this mandatory training. Um, so instead of filling in their Excel sheet, I, um, with my opinion, I recorded a usability style video of me narrating myself and my experience taking the mandatory training. Um, and this is a screenshot, and if you can't tell, that's me scowling. 
uh, at the third of four instructional PDFs that you must read before you start. Uh, and on page three of the third PDF is the description of how to use the pagination within the PDFs, uh, <laughs> which ironically you wouldn't have found if you didn't figure it out on your own. Uh, and so I recorded this video, I uh, bundled it up, it was respectful, but it was also, there were some pretty real moments, um, and I sent it back, and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't finish things quite the way you asked, I didn't fill in your Excel sheet with my opinion, but instead, here's a recording, um, and hopefully it's helpful. And I said it basically without any expectations. Nothing happened for a couple of months, and I never really thought much of it. Uh, until about a month ago when I got this email. Um, not only had they worked on improving the UX, but they had retested and they were asking for me to validate the changes that they had decided to make. Um, and this is where, you know, what you really need to do is figure out how you can add value. Uh, and in this case, it was pretty clear that having every government employee spend 15 minutes fiddling with PDFs wasn't necessarily a great use of anyone's time. Uh, and so they had decided to remove most of those PDFs. They had it down to one uh, that actually had the meaningful <laughs> information that you might need before you got started. Um, and they've actually just recently launched uh, this training. And so far, there's been a lot of positive feedback on it. So providing value to other people um, is really about giving them a choice, though. It's offering them an opportunity to see your perspective but not forcing it on them. And if we think about the matrix and this idea of the red pill and the blue pill, you know, Neil had a choice. He could take the red pill uh, and see reality or see the other perspective, or he could choose not to. And I think it's really important when you offer people your perspective uh, to realize that not everybody's going to take that opportunity and do something with what you're giving them. Um, but when you do it well, uh, and when people are able to uh, change their perspective thanks to you, sort of a game changer because then they always look at things differently. Um, but it's important to know that you can't force people. Um, you have to offer it up as a choice. And uh, as a user experience expert, you have to be a little bit humble and accept that um, not everybody's going to um, want to have their assumptions busted. Uh, which brings me to another point uh, on assumptions. Um, telling people they have terrible assumptions is not nearly as effective as asking if you can validate their hypothesis. Um, so that's just a nice uh, way of doing the same thing, um, but not uh, coming uh, forward in a threatening way. So the last sort of step or the last sort of strategy uh, that's worked for me, um, and this is really about when user experience consultancy or being an, a SME in an organization really turns into full on service design. Uh, and this is really about somebody else who has something they have to deliver. They've got a program, they've got whatever, they've got a budget that they need to do something with. And you can help them, but they are the ones with the agency for change. They are the ones that have something they need to do. Uh, and so I wanna talk a little bit about um, some work we've done is sort of our first service design exemplar uh, in my team. Uh, and it's something called this the heating assistance rebate program. And it really, what it is, is it's a little bit of money to help low income Nova Scotians pay for heating uh, each winter uh, if they qualify. And, uh, you know, it helps them maybe not have to make hard choices about whether they're gonna have lights or heat or food or any of those things. So, so the heating assistance rebate is actually based on uh, your income and your income tax from last year. And so as we were working through the interface design, we knew that at some point we were going to have to capture people whose last year's tax return didn't actually um, apply because they'd had a life event, something that changed. Think divorce, maybe a spouse has passed away, you lost your job. Things that might actually make you more vulnerable and make you more in need of the benefit uh, than you might have otherwise been. Um, and yet, not sort of the standard application. So uh, we knew, this is our first iteration that we tested, we knew this, this sort of third button wasn't going to work well, this sort of, no, my situation changed, but I think I still qualify. But we put it in the first round of testing really as a way to sort of start that conversation with anybody who was in testing who might actually be in that situation so we could better understand 
Um, it was something we kind of knew from Discovery, but we didn't really have the right language around it. Not unsurprisingly, that text didn't work very well. Uh, and when we got into our second round, uh, a little higher fidelity, uh, we had changed it to my situation has changed. Now, interestingly, in testing, we knew we had people that were in this cohort. But nobody would click on that button. Uh, and we were really struggling as a project team, thinking, how are we going to do this? We want to catch these people. We want them to apply. Uh, we know they'll qualify. Um, but how do we how do we entice them? How do we get them to click on the button? So we sort of sat around as a project team uh, the second last day of testing at the end of the day and thought, okay, let's go back into discovery research. What do we know from then? And the thing that we knew firsthand uh, was that the people we talked to who were digitally able, who were already online, who were the most likely to use the digital service, uh, almost invariably when we probed them on their internet use, they mentioned Facebook. And so we thought, okay, we've got one round of testing tomorrow. We've got five participants. Let's change the button and let's see what happens. So <laughs> we changed the button to it's complicated. And lo and behold, our first tester of the day tells the moderator on her way into the test that she just got her divorce finalized and she's looking forward to celebrating. So we're all sitting in the observation room thinking this is really interesting. I wonder what's going to happen. So she starts clicking through the eligibility uh, funnel and she gets to this screen and she doesn't hesitate. She immediately says, oh, it's complicated. That's me. Remember, I just told you I got a divorce. She clicks on it's complicated. She finds the button to click if you've recently been divorced to find out what she needs to do there. Uh, and it worked. We were all really, really excited that we had finally found something. And we knew it was going to work because Facebook had already defined what it's complicated means. Um, but to see a user validate that that was actually going to increase confidence significantly was, was really great for us as a project team. But what I will say is the real magic of this story is not that it worked well in testing. It's that when this interface was presented to the minister uh, just prior to the service going live, the minister noticed the button and said, oh, that's interesting. And without missing a beat, the program owner said, yep, we tested it. And he talked about the rounds of testing and he talked about discovery research. And here we were, the digital team, completely silent in all of this, listening to the program owner talk about the research as though it was their research and really owning that. And that was a real turning point for us. Um, that really changed the game in terms of those people feeling like those they understood their users. The other thing we did uh, with the heating assistance rebate program that we're really proud of is we built the first ever uh, service measurement dashboard, um, which included metrics from call center processing. There are still paper applicants coming in, uh, and how are those getting processed? Uh, call center volumes on particular topics. We had a few areas we were concerned about and we thought, okay, let's um, find out if we're driving any kind of call volumes. And so this was the first time for us uh, as a department where everybody in the department could see what was happening across the service, both on and offline. Uh, and uh, this has really changed how people think uh, about managing programs in our department. So joining the willing um, is really about how you can help. Help them deliver what they need to deliver. And there's a couple of things that you as a service designer or UX person can really bring to the table that maybe nobody else can. One is gaining that shared understanding, not only of the program, but of the users. Building skills and confidence, right? Letting people help prototype letting people see how testing works. And so they can speak confidently about decisions that come out of that testing. And then finally, having something like a measurement dashboard helps make future decisions more informed. And so this year, when the program relaunched, it's seasonal, um, we actually got a request to update the dashboard because there are some things that the program is wondering about, changes maybe for a future year. They wanna get some measurement on it this year while the program runs so that they can make those decisions. So joining the willing, if we were looking for a metaphor, is really more like helping other people get to moral, right? It's not your mission, you're there to help. Uh, and you might not actually always be Samwise Gamgee. You might be fighting Orc somewhere else. Uh, if you're in government, <laughs> you might actually be having a really long conversation with Ents in another department 
trying to get them to get up and get moving. Uh, and so helping other people um, and not seeing it as your ring to bear or not seeing it as a thing that you have to do, but rather that you're there in, in a support role is, is actually a really important uh, mindset. So just to recap, there's a number of ways you can get out of the checkbox. You can go out the moon door if you want. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, instead, look for the minimum viable benefit that you can bring. It is far better than making absolutely no change. Um, build trust by making things better, helping people see things from a different perspective. If you do this enough, if you do this in a way that, you know, is open and humble and adaptable, that is what's going to get you invited on these bigger journeys, on these more impactful journeys, where you can do all of the things that you're really hoping to do uh, as a UX or service designer. And so uh, that's my advice on how not to be a UX checkbox.